Welcome to Wireless Fundamentals, Session 7, AP Connectivity and Discovery. During our previous discussion about configuration, you learned that APs can use Layer 2 discovery mechanisms to find and access controller, or they can use Layer 3 mechanisms. Let's explore AP connectivity in more detail and learn more about how APs discover available access controllers. APs are connected to Ethernet switch ports. These Ethernet switch ports should meet the following criteria. Support for 1 gigabit per second. Support for power over Ethernet or PoE. Proper switch port configuration to support AP connectivity. Proper uplink configuration to provide AP to AC connectivity. Let's explore these criteria in more detail. For APs that support only 802.11 ABG, the maximum data rate possible is 54 megabits per second, which equates to about 22 megabits per second of actual real-world throughput. Nearly all enterprise class APs have both 5 and 2.4 gigahertz radios. If both radios are operating at this rate, the Ethernet port would need to handle the aggregate 44 megabits per second. In this case, a 100 megabit Ethernet port meets the need. However, you recall that 802.11n has a maximum data rate of up to 450 megabits per second with around 100 to 200 megabits per second of actual throughput. 802.11ac has a maximum data rate of 1 gigabit per second with even higher rates possible in the future. It could be possible to have a single radio approaching 500 megabits per second of actual throughput. Keep in mind that in a well-designed network with good capacity planning, such data rates would be fairly uncommon. Even so, it is obvious that 100 megabit per second ports would present a bottleneck to the flow of data. We need 1 gigabit per second ports for modern wireless deployments. It is not a good idea to connect APs to Ethernet switches that do not support PoE. This would require you to purchase a power adapter for each AP and have electricians run AC power lines to each AP location. This would be very costly and time consuming. Beyond cost concerns, this deployment would be more difficult to manage. If you ever needed to reboot an AP, someone would have to manually disconnect AC power. Furthermore, Many APs are simply not designed with external power connections. It is assumed that you will leverage PoE for any WLAN deployment. When Ethernet switches support PoE, the AP drives both power and data connectivity from the same cable. This is how WLAN should be deployed. If you ever need to reboot an AP, you can simply access its connected switch and disable PoE for that port. The AP is powered off then re-enable PoE and the AP powers back on. It is fairly rare that you need to reboot an AP. However, HP WLAN systems also support power saving features. If a business is only open between 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., you can configure the system to automatically power down APs between, say, 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next morning. This can save on utility bills and reduce total cost of ownership. There is a third option, which involves the use of a separate PoE injector. These units are typically about the size and shape of a small brick. If you have switches in your equipment rack that do not support PoE, and you only need to connect one or two APs, this can be a viable alternative. The power injectors can be mounted near the switches and powered by an available outlet in the equipment rack. You then connect an Ethernet cable from a non-PoE switch port to the data port on the injector. Then you connect a cable from the data plus power connection of the injector to the AP's Ethernet port. For a large deployment, it is often best to replace non-PoE capable switches. However, if only a small handful of APs are to be connected, using power injectors can save money and potentially help meet deployment deadlines and or budget constraints. Note that there is the same issue with AP power management as just described. 
To power an AP down, someone must physically walk to the wiring closet, unplug the power injector cable, and then plug it back in. There are two standards for PoE. 802.3 AF is the original standard and supports up to 15.4 watts of power. This is adequate for most PoE devices, such as point-of-sale terminals, basic security cameras, and most of HP's line of access points, such as the 425, 430, 460, 466, and 560 models. 802.3 AT is a later standard that can supply up to 30 watts of power. For HP switches that support this feature, it is recommended that the actual device draw less than 25.5 watts of power due to power loss over long cable runs. Some devices may require this much power to operate, such as touchscreen devices, pan tilt zoom security cameras, and HP's model MSM 466R access point. You must ensure that all AP connected switch ports are properly configured. In a typical scenario, the port link type is set to hybrid or trunk mode to allow multiple VLAN support. For example, the AC to AP communication may occur on VLAN 2, one SSID mapped to VLAN 19, while another is mapped to VLAN 11. These VLANs must all be supported on the AP attached switch port. To avoid unnecessary traffic, only the VLANs actually needed should be enabled on the port. Since VLAN 2 is being used as a kind of management VLAN, you may want to make this an untagged VLAN. Finally, PoE should be enabled on the port so the AP can power up. You must also ensure that the switch uplinks are configured to ensure that all traffic from the AP can traverse the infrastructure. This configuration typically consists of making the port link type trunk and permitting the required VLANs. When we have AP connected switch ports configured, it is time to actually connect APs to those switch ports. There are three options for connecting APs to the network. For a Layer 2 network connection, APs can be deployed in the same network subnet as an AC, with any number of Layer 2 devices between them. For a Layer 3 connection, APs can be deployed in subnets different from that of the AC. APs can also be directly connected to an AC that supports PoE. Note that if the AP connected port is configured on the same VLAN as the AC, then this is simply a variation on a Layer 2 network connection. If the port is configured on a different VLAN, then this is simply a variation of a Layer 3 connection. We want to spend the rest of this session talking about these options. Regardless of how HP Unified APs are physically connected, they use the Lightweight Access Point Protocol, or LWAP, to discover and communicate with access controllers. LWAP is also used to tunnel guest traffic between the AP and AC. Let's see how this plays out for a, a Layer 2 AP to AC connection. Once the AP boots up, it uses DHCP to acquire an IP address, subnet mask, and default gateway. It does not know the IP address of the AC, but that's okay. The AP and AC are in the same VLAN or broadcast domain. When the AP sends an LWAP discovery request message to the broadcast address, the AC receives it and checks to see if the AP has controller access. You may recall our discussion about AP templates in a previous session. Assuming the AP has access, the AC sends a discovery response back to the AP. The AP downloads the correct software version and configuration from the AC. The AP can now operate normally. In this scenario, note that the AC remains in VLAN 1. However, the AP is now in VLAN 2. The AP uses DHCP as before to get an IP address, mask, and gateway. The AP sends an LWAP broadcast, which the AC does not receive. By definition, Routers do not forward broadcast packets. 
The router is the end of a broadcast domain. The AP tries and tries some more. In this layer 3 scenario, the AP cannot discover ACs using a broadcast. We need some other mechanism to enable this discovery process. One such mechanism is to use DHCP option 43, and another is to configure DNS A records. Let's explore these mechanisms. DHCP servers can be configured with several advanced options, one of which is option 43. This option can supply the IP address of some server or other resource, a resource that is necessary for endpoint operation. For example, many voice over IP or VoIP phones are placed in a VLAN with a DHCP scope configured with option 43. This option provides the phone with the IP address of some VoIP control server. Access points can also be placed on a VLAN with a DHCP scope configured with option 43. The AP gets its IP address, mask, and default gateway as normal. Additionally, the AP uses option 43 to learn the unicast IP address of the AC. This is pretty cool. Assuming you have your infrastructure configured properly, there is nothing special to do with the AP. You can take a brand new AP out of the box, mount it, and connect it to a properly configured switch port. The AP automatically gets its addressing information and the IP address of the AC. Since it knows the unicast IP address of the AC, it sends an LWAP discovery message directly to that address. Everything else happens the same as for L2 discovery. The AC checks acceptability, sends a discovery response. Firmware is updated if need be, and configuration parameters are sent to the AP. The AP then begins to operate as normal. DNS can also be used to help the AP find an AC. DNS name lookup is based on A records, which is a simple name entry, such as hp.com along with an associated IP address. You can simply add a standard A record to your internal corporate DNS server. The AP is set from the factory to request the name hpn.domainname.com. So here at Paradise Resorts, we would add an A record to our DNS server that maps the name hpn.paradiseresorts.com to the IP address 10.0.1.2. We must also ensure that our DHCP scopes are configured to provide the IP address of the DNS server. Now, when the AP boots, it uses DHCP to get an IP address, mask, and gateway as always. Additionally, the DHCP server supplies the IP address of our DNS server, 10.1.1.100, in this example, and the domain name in use. The AP makes a few attempts at L2 broadcast discovery. After those all fail, the AP sends a DNS name lookup request to the DNS server. The server responds with the IP address of the AC, 10.0.1.2. Now that the AP knows the unicast IP address of the AC, the process is as previously described. The AP sends a unicast discovery request and gets a reply. Firmware is updated, the AP is configured, and begins to operate normally. So, which method is best? Well, a valid case could be made for either DHCP option 43 or DNS. With option 43, everything comes from the DHCP server, IP, mask, gateway, and the AC's IP address. Some consider this a cleaner, more streamlined method. You only need to configure the DHCP option. There's no DNS involved, so there's less to go wrong. However, configuring DHCP option 43 on, say, a Microsoft server platform requires several steps, and all must be done correctly. It's really not that bad, but the first time or two you do it, it may seem so. With the DNS option, DHCP first provides the IP address of the DNS server. So the DNS server can provide 
the IP address of the AC. It is very easy to configure an A record on a DNS server, and most corporations have someone that can do this for you. Some corporations have a network group that does things like WLAN deployment and a separate server group that handles DNS changes. If this group is too busy or uncooperative, maybe the DHCP option is a better way to go. On the other hand, many people know how to configure an A record off the top of their head without much thought. While you might need to go look up the steps to configure DHCP option 43. Again, this is one of those things that comes down to the specifics of the situation and personal preference. If I run into a colleague or a client that feels strongly about either method, I'll just use that one. An even more fundamental choice is between L2 and L3 connectivity. You've probably already guessed how this discussion will go, huh? L2 discovery is very easy to pull off. No special DHCP configuration and no DNS configuration. Just a simple broadcast discovery mechanism. Easy. Great for small deployments with only a dozen APs or so. I recently had a colleague tell me about a large WLAN deployment for a hospital with over 2 million square feet of space, requiring nearly 700 APs. We certainly wouldn't want 700 APs all chattering away on a single VLAN and a network management VLAN at that. In these cases, some experienced engineers prefer to split the APs into logical groups of 75 to 125 APs and then reserve a block of 10 VLANs to be used solely for AP management. The 80 APs on the first floor of Building 1 might be on VLAN 101 and use AC1 as their primary controller, as assigned by DHCP option 43 perhaps. The 76 APs on the second floor can use VLAN 102 and use AC2 as their primary controller, and so on. This limits the size of the broadcast domain to a healthy level and provides some fault isolation. A major problem related to VLAN 101 will only affect first floor APs, and so on. As you can see, the enterprise class deployments that we use here at Paradise Resorts will always use a scalable layer 3 discovery mechanism. You've now learned about how APs find and connect to ACs and how to ensure that ACs properly accept, configure, and manage APs. Now that APs and ACs are working together as a team, we need to understand how to optimize this relationship in order to maximize the user experience. Let's take a short break before moving on to the next session, which is focused on Radio Resource Management, or RRM. You'll learn about the real-world considerations related to RF cell size, as well as HP's intelligent methods of optimizing the user experience by maximizing RF performance.